You can put away your phones and your computers and you don't need to take notes. This is just a story. Um, it's going to foreshadow a lot of the themes in the course, um, but it's not stuff you're going to be tested on. Okay. So um, this is a true story, and I've changed only a few tiny little bits uh, to protect the identity of the people involved, but otherwise it's an absolutely true story. It's a story about a scary medical situation that happened to a friend of mine a few years ago. But at the same time, it's a story about the nature of the human mind, about the organization of the human brain, um, and it's also a story about uh, the ability, or lack thereof, uh, to recover after brain damage. It's also, incidentally, a story about uh, resilience, uh, privilege, expertise, and all of those things that are characteristic of many people in Cambridge society. <laughs> um, not so relevant for the course, but. All right, here goes. Um, so a few years ago, a friend of mine was staying over at my house in Cambridge en route to a conference in a nearby state. And this guy, I'll call him Bob, uh, was a close friend of mine. I'd known him for years and years. Um, we, had, we talked regularly. We went on hiking trips together. We were pretty close. So he's en route to this conference. He's staying over at my house the night before. Um, and he, the plan was for him to get up early the next morning and drive to the conference. So we hung out the night before and chatted. And the next morning, he's sleeping in the next room over from mine. And early in the morning, I hear some shuffling. I think, yep, okay, Bob is packing to leave. And thank God I don't need to get up. I'm only dimly awake. And so I'm not paying that much attention. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle in the background. And then I hear a crash. And I think, what the hell is that? And I get up, and I go into the next room, and Bob is lying on the floor, not moving. I say, Bob, and there's no answer. And then I shout, Bob, and there's no answer. And then I dialed 911. While we were sitting there, waiting for the ambulance to arrive, Bob starts to wake up. And he's very woozy, but he's alive and he's making a little bit of sense, and he can't figure out what's going on, and neither can I. And so we're talking and chatting, and he's making a little more sense, but we still don't know what's happening. So then the ambulance arrives incredibly fast. It felt like three minutes, boom. There's three EMTs rushing in the front door, rushing up to the room where Bob was, and they take all his vitals, and they can't find anything wrong. And so they're really casual. I guess they confront stuff like this all the time. I don't. Bob doesn't. But they're very calm about it. And they're saying, well, you can take him to the hospital or not. And I was like, I think we need to know what just happened. Even though he seems OK, we kind of need to know what this is all about, don't you think? And they're like, yeah, you can take him to the ER. And I said, well, um, do we need to waste ambulance resources, or do you think it's safe if I drive him myself, since there's a hospital not far away? They say, you could drive him yourself. So I drive Bob to the Mount Auburn Hospital ER, which is like less than a mile from my house. And we do the usual ER thing, which is mostly waiting and waiting and waiting. But various docs come by, and they take all these tests, and they take all these history questions, and it goes on and on. And basically, they're just not finding anything. So after about an hour or two of this, they're still doing tests. They don't want to quite let him go yet because they don't know what happened. Everybody's calm about it. I figure, OK, fine. I got work to do. Um, and I tell Bob, um, you know, text me throughout the day, and I'll come get you whenever they're ready to release you. And so um, I go into work. But just before I go into work, a thought flashes through my mind. And I say to the ER doc, you know, you should check Bob's brain. And the reason that thought flashed through my mind is that actually I had been worrying about Bob for a number of years. And I hadn't really, it hadn't quite registered consciously. I hadn't, it was kind of too horrifying a thought for me to really allow myself to realize I was worried about Bob's brain. But I was worried about a very particular thing. And that is that Bob had been showing these weird signs that he often got lost and didn't know where he was. 
And on the one hand, this just didn't make any sense because he was fine in every other way. But it was really pretty striking. So one time, um, I was over at Bob's house with some other friends of ours. And the friend asked Bob, how do, we get, how do I drive from your house into Cambridge? And Bob said, well, you go to the end of the driveway and you turn left. My friend and I looked at each other like, Bob, what? And Bob thinks about it for a minute. Yeah, end of the driveway, turn left. And I just had this like sinking feeling of dread in the pit of my stomach. But we sort of made light of it and made fun of it. And it went by. It was like, no, you turn right. And we gave the directions. Another time, a friend of mine was driving with Bob in Bob's hometown and noticed that like, Bob didn't seem to know how to get to the grocery store in his hometown, where he'd lived for a really long time, uh, and you know, a trip he'd made hundreds of times. Another time, I was at a conference in Germany, and I saw you know, there are these arrays of posters of people presenting usually pretty dry scientific things. And out of the corner of my eye, I see the title of a poster, and it says, Navigational Deficits, colon, an early sign of Alzheimer's. And I saw that, and I just thought, <gasps> And I just kind of suppressed the thought. I thought, oh my God, Bob wasn't that old. I know Alzheimer's can very rarely strike early. I just, I didn't want to think about it, but it was like r rattling around in the back of, back of my consciousness. So there had been these signs. But as I say, they didn't make sense because Bob was holding down a very high powered job. He was writing beautiful prose. He was the life of every party he was at. Witty, funny, everybody's like, favorite life of the party. So how could that be? Like it just didn't make sense that there would be anything wrong with Bob's brain. So I managed for a few years to notice these signs and ignore them and not pay any attention. The killer thing is I should have known better. My research for the last 20 years has been on the very fact that there are different parts of the brain that do different things. And one of the corollaries of that is you can have a problem with one of those parts and the other parts can work just fine. And so I, if anyone, should have realized, yes, there's something really wrong with Bob's navigation abilities. And the fact that he's smart and witty and funny and holding down a high powered job doesn't mean there isn't something wrong with his brain, with a part of his brain. But I didn't realize that. But then, you know, as I'm leaving the ER, it kind of all clicked. And I said to the ER doc, you better check his brain. I thought Bob was out of earshot when I said that. He heard it. He's like, what? I was like, oh, never mind. Um, anyway, the ER doc, with the kind of confidence that only docs can muster, said, nope, not a brain thing. This is a heart thing, which wasn't exactly reassuring. Um, but I set aside the, the brain thought. Um, and I went off to work. Throughout the day, I texted with Bob a few times. Things seemed to be fine. They'd done more tests. They weren't finding anything. We just got calmer and calmer about it. I guess sometimes weird stuff happens and you just move on. But then that night, around seven or eight at night, I was over at a friend's house and the phone rang and it was Bob. I picked it up and Bob says, get over here. They found something in my brain. So I ran out of the house, grabbed my phone, and as I'm driving to the Mount Auburn ER, um, I called my trusty lab tech, an amazing guy who keeps track of all kinds of things much better than I do, and I said, I remember that we scanned Bob a bunch of years ago for a regular experiment in my lab. And I don't remember the date, I don't remember anything about it, but dig around in the files and see if you can figure it out. It might be useful to have that scan. So by the time I get to the ER, my lab tech has already uh, texted me back and said, found the scans, I'm putting them in a Dropbox for you. So I go into the ER and there's Bob in the ER doc. And Bob says to me, um, do you wanna see it? The ER doc or the radiologist has already shown Bob the picture of his brain. And so they take me in there and I look at it and I gulped. There was a thing the size of a lime smack in the middle of his brain. Pretty terrifying. 
So, um, this lime in the middle of Bob's brain was right next to a region that my lab had studied in great detail. In fact, my lab had discovered that a brain region right next to where that lime was located was specifically involved in navigation. How could I not have put all this together? But I didn't until that moment. And I thought, of course, of course there's a thing in his brain right next to the parahippocampal place area, which I discovered, and a nearby related region called retrospuineal cortex, of course. And how the hell could I not have known? But I didn't know. Um, in that earlier work, it had been nearly 20 years ago, I had a postdoc named Russell Epstein. And Russell was a computer vision guy, and he wanted to understand how we see by writing code to duplicate the algorithms that he thought go on in the human brain when we understand visual images. And that's a very respectable, cool line of work, which we'll learn a little bit about in here. Um, and Russell was really a coding guy. At the time, we were just starting doing brain imaging. Um, but Russell was like poo-pooing it all. It's like the flash in the pan, it's gonna go by, it's trashy, so you guys get nice blobs on the brain. I'm not having any of it. And I kept saying, Russell, you need to get a job. Just do one experiment so you can show in your job talk that you can do brain imaging. It might help you. You don't need to do a lot of it. Just do one dumb experiment. Russell was interested in how we recognize scenes, not just objects and faces and words, but how do we know where we are and how do we recognize if the scene is a city or a beach or whatever it is. I said, okay, Russell, we'll just scan people looking at pictures of scenes and looking at other kinds of pictures. And we'll just kind of see if there's any part of the brain that responds a lot to scenes. It really was not well thought out. This is not how you do, should do an experiment. It shouldn't be based on political calculations, lack of theory, any of the above. But the fact is, that's why we did that experiment. Russell needed to be able to show a brain image in his job talk. So we scanned some people looking at scenes. And the results knocked our socks off. We found a part of the brain that responds very selectively when you look at images of, of scenes, not when you look at faces, objects, words, or pretty much anything else. And so we'll learn more about that later in the course. We called it the parahippocampal place area, and that launched a whole major line of work in my lab and now dozens of other labs around the world. So backtrack, we'd already found that region, and here's this lime in my friend Bob's brain sitting right next to the parahippocampal place area. So then I remembered, let's look at the scans from my lab from a few years ago in Bob's brain. And so I fiddled around and found, managed to download the files. And there it was. You could see that same blob. But in the scans from a few years before, it was much smaller. It was the size of a grape, right? And so that told us a bunch of things. Most importantly, it told us this thing is growing really slowly. And that was hugely important because brain tumors are very bad news. Um, and they usually grow really fast. And the fact that it grew really slowly told us that this was not one of the kind of worst, most invasive, most horrible ones. It was clearly a problem. It was big, um, but at least it wasn't growing hugely fast. But how poignant that there it was in my own damn data and I hadn't seen it in my friend's brain. Well, I'm not a radiologist. <laughs> I'm a basic researcher and I didn't look and I didn't see it. Um, so indeed, the next day, the, uh, the docs told us that they thought this was meningioma, not cancer. Who knew that you could have tumors that weren't cancer, but you can. Um, and they still need to come out if they're big enough, and that's very serious, but it's not as bad as having uh, a cancer in your brain. Um, so as we're collecting information, the next day I'm hanging out in the hospital room, and there was an amusing moment when one of the residents came by and he's taking the history and asking all the basic questions. And I said kind of sheepishly, because you don't want to seem like you know more than the residents. And in fact, I didn't really know more, but I just thought I'd provide a little information. I said, you know, he's actually had symptoms for a bunch of years and there's a, there's a region of the brain nearby that, you know, that I, I've actually studied a little bit. And the residents is like, we know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, so much for my, you know, trying to stay under the radar. Um, I, that afternoon, I talked to a neurosurgeon friend of mine because uh, I figured, okay, we need, we need advice, we need help. And the um, 
the neurosurgeon friend said, um, quote, it like got branded in my brain. She said, it is of paramount importance that you find the best neurosurgeon. It's the difference between whether Bob dies on the table or goes on to live a normal life. So this is the privileged part of the story. I'm not that well connected, but I'm a little bit connected and I kind of dug around and did what I could. And we spent a couple of weeks and we found the best neurosurgeon. And uh, the night before the surgery, Bob is staying over at my house because the surgery was in a Boston hospital. And I thought, you know, I've been dancing around this for years, but now like it's all out in the open. We know there's a problem and I'm gonna test him. I'm gonna find out what the hell's going on. Um, this is, after all, one of the basic uh, forms of data that we collect in my field. That is testing people with problems in their brain to try to figure out what things they can do and what things they can't do. It's a way of figuring out what the basic components of the mind and brain are. It's actually the oldest, most venerable method in our field, and it's still a hugely important one. So I thought, what the hell? So I said, okay, Bob, draw me a sketch map of the floor plan of your house. And so Bob takes a few minutes and he draws this thing. And it was shocking. There weren't even, you know, the, the rooms in a kind of rectilinearly arranged house, they weren't even aligned. There was like a soup of lines. There was no organization from one room to the next. And Bob kind of realized this kind of isn't right, is it? But he didn't know how to fix it. And he said he just couldn't visualize what it looked like to be in his house. And so he couldn't draw the floor plan. And I thought, okay, he hasn't been there in a couple of days. So I gave him another piece of paper and I said, okay, draw the floor plan of my house where you are right now. Um, and so Bob took a couple minutes and delivered a similar mess. He couldn't even imagine the layout of the room next to him that he'd been at, been in a few minutes before. And then, trying to channel my inner neuropsychologist, I thought, okay. Gave him another piece of paper and I said, okay, Bob, try a draw a bicycle. Why did I choose a bicycle? Because it's a multi-part object that has a bunch of different bits that have a particular relationship to each other. Just as the rooms in a house have a particular spatial relationship to each other. And I wanted to know, is his problem specifically about places or is it about any complex multi-part thing that you have to remember the relationships to? Bob is no artist, to put it mildly, but his bicycle was clearly recognizable as a bicycle. It had the two wheels and the right relationship and you know, it had all the basic parts in roughly the same, the right place. I then had him draw a lobster, another multi-part object, and also his lobster was not beautiful, but had everything in the right place. And so that's very telling. He had a specific problem in, I don't know, imagining, reproducing, remembering, it's not totally clear the arrangements of parts in a room, but not the arrangements of parts in an object. Okay, and we'll get back to that more in a few weeks. So the next day, Bob has an 11 hour surgery, major, hardcore, extreme neurosurgery. Remove a huge piece of bone from the back of your head, pull apart the hemispheres of the brain like this, go in like multiple inches and remove a lime. Like, holy crap, right? Uh, said Lyme was right near the vein of Galen, right? Galen lived, what, a couple thousand years ago. The fact that there's a vein of Galen means it's a big ass vein, the kind of vein that even Galen would have found with, you know, dissection 2000 years ago. This Lyme was all wrapped around and interleaved with the vein of Galen, not good. But because we found the best neurosurgeon and because we have extreme privilege um, and all the all the possible medical resources and expertise you could possibly hope for. Bob sailed through the surgery, and an hour after the surgery, I'm chatting with him and he's making sense. Amazing, right? And, and you know, two, literally two days later, they sent him home. And a few days after that, he's back at work, no problem, totally fine. But now we get to the question you're probably thinking about, what about his navigational abilities? The sad answer is nothing doing. None of it came back at all. Uh, thank God for iPhones. If Bob lived 30 years ago, he wouldn't be able to function. But he goes everywhere using his iPhone GPS, everywhere. Um, 
And this fact that he didn't recover his navigational abilities is consistent with a whole literature that we'll consider later in the course. Um, that often, not always, but often, if you have brain damage, especially to some of these very specialized circuits that we'll talk about, um, you don't recover later. If the damage is early, you may well recover. Early in life, you may re well recover. Children have much more plastic brains that can adjust after brain damage. Adults, not so good. Yeah. So Bob's doing fine. That's my story. 